Chubb. Towards the end of last week, there seemed to be some promise of better weather for grayling fishing, and I took down a rod for the first time this year, and went off to a grayling river with a good supply of cockspurs and brandlings. Several other people had made the same mistakes, and there was a decided melancholy in the inn. The river was still full. It dropped a little one day, but rain in the night brought it up again, and on Friday it was rising all day. On Saturday, the last of the other fishermen departed. He had caught, in three days' fishing, one sizable fish, but on the last day he said he had had hold of something big which had broken away from him. He thought it must have been a chub. Until he said this, I had forgotten that there were chub in the river. There are not a great many, but in some stretches there are a few pike. It is not a regular chub river like the wire, and no one visits it with the special object of fishing for chub. Chub, in fact, in the north, do not get the attention they deserve. In the wire, for example, people complain that the chub are so many and so rapacious that on some days they will not allow sea trout to take a fly, grabbing it themselves before the sea trout have a chance at it. One would think that in winter the trout fishers, anxious to improve the river, would spend a little time in fishing for chub, just as in other rivers they fish in winter for grayling and pike, thus having their cake and eating it, getting good winter fishing, and thereby making summer and autumn fishing better. Now this disappointed grayling fisher spoke of that chub with contempt instead of gratitude, though the chub had given the only moment of interest to a melancholy day. On such a day, I should feel ready to forgive a chub who should take my bait his presence in a river normally without need of him, since it has salmon and trout for the warmer months and grayling for the months in which we cannot fish for these. I felt that he was a little ungrateful to that chub and thought how odd it was that in different parts of the country the same fish should be so differently esteemed. I remembered the last occasion on which I had heard a man speak of chub in the evening of a day made memorable for me by a Thames trout. There is in the South Country an inn of a most pleasing character with a delightful name. It is called The Rose Revived, and its signboard, painted by a celebrated architect, shows a rose being revived in a glass of sherry. This inn is hard by a bridge called New Bridge, because it is the oldest over the Thames. To this inn, in the evening, many fishermen gathered from the roach swims up and down the river, and in the moonlight outside it I met an old man for whom, without knowing him, I felt already some affection, since he was a living witness that on that day I had caught the biggest trout I had ever caught, and, for a simple reason, had not got that trout to gloat over, or to eat, or to put into a glass case. He was, though a mere human being, a representative, as it were, of that very handsome, happily departed fish. He had been on the opposite bank of the river, and had watched me land this big and wise Thames trout, who, knowing that the season was just over, had risked himself on my roach tackle. It had taken me a long time to cousin him out from under the willow branches draped with weed by the late floods, and when I had carefully weighed him, three pounds, four ounces, and a little bit over, all the bystanders breathed heavily as I slid him into the water again. The old man, whom I met in the moonlight by the inn, had left his own fishing to watch the episode I have just set down, and now as if to comfort me for being without my noble trout, he offered me a box of stewed wheat, with which he said I should catch gigantic roach. And then he began to talk of the river the Thames had been, and how the passion of his life was neither for trout nor roach, though he had not a word to say against these fish, but for chub. He told me that he had fished for chub for thirty-five years, and always had set them back for the good of the river even as I had set back my Thames trout. In the north, a captured chub has a better chance of being thrown over a hedge than of being returned to the water, in which he is considered vermin and nothing more. Yet, like Goldsmith, he can say that there are places where he, too, is admired. Many years ago, an old fisherman, about to die, 
knowing that he could fish no more, made me a present of his chub float, a monstrous thing of cork and quill, and, as he gave it to me, told me of this or that old loggerhead who had dragged it under water. It was almost as if he were the dying priest of some heathen religion, presenting me on his deathbed with a sacrificial knife, exulting in retrospect on the victims who had felt it. In the moonlight, by that old bridge over the Thames, I remembered this old float and its long-dead owner. And listening to the enthusiasm of the old chub hunter, I thought, how strange a passion this is, that singles out here a man and there a man, and makes him a fisherman apart, to pursue this nervous, handsome, altogether uneatable fish. I remember J. W. Martin's story of Chubber Childs, who, after they had been separated many years, sent Martin a message to say that he was after them yet knowing that Martin would know exactly what he meant. And then the old chub hunter began to speak of baits for chub, of which there are no end, and he praised exceedingly the tale of the crayfish, in this way reminding me of Aksakoff and of sunlit days on the Moscow River and of fishing of the kind Aksakoff loved. Aksakoff is full of praise of the crayfish as a bait for chub and some of his equally rapacious cousins. The old man went on to tell me a strange thing, with the tail of a crayfish, he said, he could catch great quantities of chub. But when he could not get that bait and bought prawns or dug lobworms or shaped lumps of paste or sank his hook in a cherry, he could catch him never a chub. Though with these baits, other men were successful who could do nothing with his crayfish. And all the time, as he spoke of the chub, there was a warm glow in his words. That sort of glow that is in the words of some men when they speak of salmon. The sort of passion that I have felt in a bear hunter describing the tracking of the bear. And now, up here in the north, there was this grayling fisher talking of the hooking of that chub with as much contempt as if he had got hold of an old bucket. My barbel. I have never fished for barbel. Fishing for barbel needs a greater expenditure of worms and faith than I have ever been in a position to afford. You enrich the river with a thousand lobworms daily for a week to induce the barbel to look at worms favourably. Then you fish for him. His choice of feeding places is such that you lose great quantities of tackle in the bottom of the river. But you hardly ever catch a barbel even after this prodigious baiting. It is a sorry business persisted in because once or twice in a lifetime an angler finds the barbel on the feed, and because no man who has ever caught a barbel can refrain from chanting the praises of this pig, this wild boar, rather, of the river. He is the hardest, most obstinate fighter of any of the coarse fish. Martin has sung his glory, but even he found himself wondering whether the game was worth the candle and how many tens of thousands of worms and stones of boiled scratchings had been dribbled down the barbel swims of various rivers in vain. Bickerdyke, the most instructive optimist, has told us exactly how to fish for him. But nowadays, your true barbel fisher, who devotes his life to the pursuit of this strange, strong, bearded bottom feeder, is rare. Barbel fishing, like mathematical philosophy, has disheartened so many by seeming to lead to nowhere. Consequently, when I went to the Thames, taking one thing with another, the high price of worms, the time of year, far too late, and the extreme unlikelihood of catching any, I decided to leave the barbel alone. I knew the fish were there, but though a recent guide to the Thames fishing had said of this place and of that, Barbel are to be had here. A deeply experienced Thames fisherman had commented, The barbel are there, but they are not to be had. The only thing to be had is the fisherman. So I did not fish for barbel. Yet in the evening of my last day of Thames fishing, I caught one, and am compelled, like all the other men who have caught barbel, to pay tribute to him. For it is perfectly true that there is no coarse fish to equal him in prolonged pugnacity and power. He deserves all that has been said in praise of him. Mine was but a moderate barbel, six and a half pounds, 
but he gave me a harder fight than any fish I have ever landed of any species whatever. Since it is possible that the same conditions may occur again and that other anglers may similarly catch a barbel at the expense of four seedy lobworms instead of 7,000 good ones, I shall set down in detail how it happened. I had taken my tackle and was on my way home along the bank of the river, thinking that my Thames fishing was over and that I should have to be content with a total catch of two Thames trout returned, some pike, some roach, some dace, some perch, some chub, some gudgeons, two minnows and a bullhead. None, barring one of the trout, of any remarkable size. When I happened to notice a narrow alley of smooth, slow water close under my own bank. It was a very likely-looking roach swim. I had been paternostering for perch and had in my bag no Thames float tackle but only a very small grayling float and a light North Country roach cast, carrying a single shot. There were a few worms left in the bag. I found a depth of four or five feet and sent the tail of a lobworm down the swim. It was taken by a six-ounce dace. I sent down another. It was taken by a half-pound roach. This was encouraging. I found four dead worms and broke up two and threw them in well above the head of the swim. I sent down the tail of a lobworm again. Close under the bank, the float jerked hard under. I thought I was in a weed and pulled lightly in time to feel a heavy tug and to know that I had lost a fish. I threw in the remaining two dead worms. Now all this time I had never thought of barbel, but without intent had been doing what, if I had hoped for a barbel, I might well have done on purpose. The next time the little float sailed down, it came to the place where it had gone under before, passed it, and then went under suddenly and sideways. I struck, and a second later was thanking my stars that the line had not caught, as it often had on that windy day, round a handle of the reel. Instead of pulling a roach to the surface, I was in battle with something tugging and boring far out and deep down in the middle of the river. I thought it was a pike, and I expected the bitten gut to come back to me at once. Then, as the fish rushed upstream, I realized that the manner of his play was not that of a pike. There was no corkscrew, undulate feeling about it. It was tugging like a perch, but I knew it was too big for any perch. I thought I had at last got hold of a really big chub, but a chub does not fight for very long, and as the battle continued and I found myself running up the river, for I had no great length of line on my reel, I thought with some resentment that this was a third Thames trout, and that however big he was, I should have to return him to the water. He went on being a trout for the rest of the battle, until, after charging suddenly into the bank and weeding himself, he became a trout of most unusual strength. Up to that moment, I had put him down in my mind as a trout of five or six pounds. But then, while he was under my feet, in the sedges, I felt the hook slip. For about half a second, I thought I had lost him. And then out he dashed into the river again, apparently double the size and with four times the energy that he had previously had. I could do nothing with him at all, except run after him. We went a hundred yards up the river, and then he turned round and set off for London. Trying to keep below and ahead of him to turn him, I stumbled along in the dusk while he swam deep in the river, now and then jerking the rod down by angry tugs. It grew dark, when, after he had turned twice and gone up river and down again, he began to weaken and allowed me at last to see my float. By this time, other fishermen had joined me, but not one of them had a bigger net than my own small trout net. That's a big pike you have hold of, said one. It's a quarter of a mile to where you were fishing. It's no pike but a trout, said I. And then, at last, he came to the top and turned over, and we saw the barbules hanging from his lips. I got him into the net and lifted it out by the rim, and there was my six-and-a-half-pound barbel with the hook right in the middle of his broad side about three inches behind the gill covers. The hook fell out when I touched it. I think he had been properly hooked, though lightly, in the beginning, and that he had first freed and then foul-hooked himself during the tussle under the bank. That this explained the strange redoubling of his strength, and that, all things considered, I was exceedingly lucky to get him. 
next year, I'm afraid, be the price of worms what it may, I shall fish for barbel in the orthodox manner. And, no doubt, be myself sufficiently orthodox not to catch any. <laughs>